Um, well, but first, you want to see one. Uh, we did get to do, this was our first land tour. As I, as I mentioned a second ago, the land tours were some of the more memorable parts of the whole place. And the whole thing was incredible. But um, the land tours got you in close contact with this. I don't remember who this was. Uh, I've forgotten her name a long time ago. But the, um, it's, not important. it's not important, right. But what is important is how close she's getting to uh, this iguana here. This is a land iguana. That's not one of the marine iguanas. We'll talk about them a little bit later. But the land iguanas would literally walk over your feet as you were walking around this place. This is an area that has never seen uh, predators until humans showed up. So these are animals that have adapted to be overly friendly and not be afraid of people. And so you get, you know, land iguanas that would just kind of laze about and wonder why you're trying to get in the way. And then there'd be boobies that would be blue-footed booby. If you've never seen the dance of a blue-footed booby, it's incredible. They, uh, they just kind of do this. And in fact, I did this to Sarah uh, that evening, and it worked. It was wonderful. Um, <laughs> Birds were, were uh, amazing as well. This is our good friend Larry again uh, with his camera just shooting up at a frigate bird that was going over. And uh, so the seabirds, uh, all, the, all the life there online was amazing. Oh, finally, we get to get to Darwin. I keep mentioning this. Um, Darwin and Wolf are really why you go to Galapagos. Now, not to say that the other dives and the other places sucked. As you can see, there's uh, some unique things about each of the sites we visited in such a way that. Each one of those is pretty incredible, but Darwin and Wolf are what you think of when you think of Galapagos underwater. That's where the big life happens. And the place that you dive at Darwin is this arch right here. Now, if you look at, this is the main island of Darwin, and this is where you anchor. This arch is just kind of an islet right offshore. So if you look at a map of the area, you'll notice that this is, Darwin, this is the arch down here. And what's happening is you've got this current that comes in from the southeast. And as soon as it hits this islet, it splits off into a north and a south branch. And you can dive either along here or along here, and you'll still get an incredible abundance of life. Now, that's a lot of words to just tell you that these currents are bringing in and just creating a magnet for big life. So this was just on our first dive down. Uh, I just splashed down, and I noticed that uh, you just see this incredible abundance of fishes. Things like, these are big eye alua, surrounding them are creole fish. And this is so many fish that I'm talking where it's like blotting out the sunlight as you're going underneath this school sometimes. It's just, they're tight in and they're just everywhere. So um, that was one of the things that you would, one of the overrating kind of things that you remember as you come away from this trip was how fit the life is there as compared to anywhere else that I've ever been, certainly, and where most other people have been as well. This is um, some girl, I've forgotten her name, and behind her is a whole bunch of bonito. So that's just a whole, that's a shoal of like thousands of bonito, small tuna, that are just swimming around behind us. Is, is she just, is I got a pair of shorts of that. Yes, yeah, the, the water temperature of Wolf and Darwin this time of year, I think it was like 75 degrees. So, but we'll touch on that in a little bit, because it changes a lot. Uh, yeah, and, 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 but the really cool thing that Kevin just brought up is the fact that some of these sites are predictably very, very warm, tropical diving. And some of the sites are predictably very, very cold, as in down to about 60, 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, it varies drastically. It's, it's chilly to me. It's chilly to me. That's a damn part for me. Just a skin, right? <laughs> So I'm just going to walk you through a few of the communities of things you would see around the around diving Darwin and Wolf. And the first thing you would notice are these these little tiny pinfish, or maybe you wouldn't notice it. Uh, these are just little species of wrasse, a type of thalassoma, much like the saddle wrasse we have here. These are actually much smaller than they. But unlike our saddle wrasse, they're just kind of a blanket that cruises around. And what they're doing here, they're actually spawning. Each of these little white specks up here are little clouds of gametes that they're sending off, um, casting off, and contributing to the productivity of the rest of the area. Uh, outside of them, you would see these creole fish. The creole fish were just everywhere. And I mean, just constantly. So as you're trying to take a picture of just like a Galapagos shark, for example, they get in your way. So suddenly you've got these little red flashes of um, antheas. They're a type of antheas that would just be swimming everywhere. Um, outside of those, you get the, these jacks. So that, the, the jacks were 
fascinating. When you, when you got in the middle of a school of big eye, uh, big eye jacks, you would be in a school of thousands and thousands and thousands of them. They just keep going and going. But uh, you saw also the blue, blue fin trevally that we have here, the giant trevally that we have here, and these black trevally that we have. The black trevally are different in that they have a concave forehead to them. You don't usually see them here. They do sometimes show up. Um, and of course, outside of those, you'd get the hammerheads. And we're, we're going to talk, touch a little bit more on the hammerheads here. But the hammerheads were uh, just constant. It was just a parade of hammerheads as you were down there. And we did like eight dives at Darwin, eight dives at Wolf. And I, I, we saw hammerheads on every dive. Um, and I don't remember a time when we didn't see hammerheads off in the distance. And the visibility was not just stellar. It was probably 40, 50 feet. So you got the impression as you're looking off, staring into the blue that the hammerheads, you'd see probably 20 of them in front of you, but you got the impression that they were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds behind those. It was incredible. Um, and then outside of the hammerheads and outside of the sharks, you'd get just schools of tuna. And we're not just talking these. These are bonito. This is just a shoal of bonito that happened to pass through. Um, but you'd also get the big, the big bruisers. This was probably a six or a seven foot long yellowfin tuna that came through. Um, and then we saw probably, what, six, two or three of these at least. And the, the bigger yellowfin tend to be more of, a, more of an individual thing, so they just kind of be cruising through on their own. Really, just fascinating life. And of course the silkies, I can't leave these guys out. The silkies, we started noticing that they were trailing the liveaboard as we set anchor. In fact, they were almost there immediately. And, uh, so as we came back and in between dives, we did about four dives a day every day at Wolf and Darwin. So while we were at Darwin, between every dive just about, we'd jump in the panga and go up to the bow of the master, that's the liveaboard that we were on, and just kind of drift back, and there would be about 20 or so silky sharks. And if you played with the silky sharks around here, you'd see they're probably about five or six feet long. The ones up there were easily nine feet, something like that. Huge animals. And so they just came right in, and they were just very, very nosy, very curious. And that brings us on to wolf, and this is where we get to kind of talk more about the sharks that are up there, because that's what most people are there to see. And of course, the first thing that people think of when they think of sharks are the hammerheads. And yes, we saw a hammerhead here and there. In fact, we saw a, a few hammerheads, and we, we saw a lot of hammerheads. Yeah, I, we're talking right here. In fact, I was just I was just kind of hanging out with my buddy when one of them passed right between us. And we saw a lot of hammerheads. I mean, just hammerheads, hammerheads, hammerheads. But they would be falling around these kind of currents. You see, when you're diving in these high current environments, you saw the currents at Darwin. You'd have to go down, you'd have to grab hold of a rock and just kind of hang on, just almost flap like a flag in the breeze at times, you know? And so you're just hanging on for dear life, and if you let go, then you get swept away into um, a heavy surf area that would almost undoubtedly kill you, or into a, a channel that was pretty death-defying, or it, it, you just get swept away and you'd have to pop your sausage and hopefully um, the boat would find you again. But So you're hanging on for dear life onto these rocks, and I, when, thi when I took this photo, we were literally watching a thermal climb work its way up until it's, it, I was wearing a, a really tattered three mil wetsuit and that's it. And so this thermal climb was working its way up and you could see it and you knew that it was cold because it just looked cold down there. <laughs> and it's working its way up and you're hanging onto this rock, you can't move and it just came up and it just enveloped us. And it was the coldest, oh God, that was so cold. I was screaming through my regulator. Um, 10 degrees different. 10 degrees different. You can see it. It was, it was a dark green color underneath and it was like a, a pretty tropical blue above it. You can and see the shimmer. Yeah, you can see the, the, this is just in the thermocline. These sharks are just hanging out. And I, I don't get it. Why? Why would they hang out in the cold water? It's not fair. It's not fun. Um, but after that, I started wearing a hood on every dive, whether I needed it or not, because it was just that. I, I didn't want another thermocline to surprise me like that. That was not. It was fun. So anyway, yeah, sharks. Uh, Galapagos sharks, very, very common. The ones there were bruisers. They were up to easily as big as the silky, eight, nine feet long. They were huge, bigger than me, easily. Um, and we, we got quite a few of those. In fact, there was one spot at, spot at Darwin where you just see a school of those go by, almost as big as the schools of hammerheads you were watching at the same time. It was just incredible. But at some point, you have to leave the islands, and you have to go somewhere else. And you know, I know in the Galapagos, it can be tough to find interesting things to look at. 
Uh, I'm saying that sarcastically because uh, as you're looking here, you're seeing what four different endemic underwater animals we all saw at our next stop at Fernandina. Uh, we've got with the, the Galapagos horn shark here, which is Herodontus koi. Uh, they, they're adorable. They're about that big. If you're familiar with the California horn sharks, they get a little bit bigger. Um, these ones are significantly smaller, and they're just cute. Um, and we saw those in a couple of spots. Also, these, these guys are kind of everywhere. Um, they look like koi, if you're familiar with the goldfish koi. Uh, but they're a type of wrasse, in fact. And this is a, a terminal phase. And also, of course, the red-lipped batfish that uh, everybody goes down there to see. But honestly, I wasn't there for the batfish. I was there for more like stuff like this. This is a cormorant, a flightless cormorant. So when you see them sunning themselves, they've got these stubby little wings. Because their ancestors made it to the Galapagos and figured out that they didn't need to develop these big developed wings. So they lost the use of them. Their, their wings are more vestigial. They, they just kind of use them underwater at best. Actually, they use more their feet than anything. Uh, but they, these are really, really special. When you see a cormorant of the Galapagos, if you happen to go, pay attention to it, because it is a very, very special animal. But we weren't there for the uh, cormorants. We weren't there for anything else. We were there for the marine iguanas. The marine iguanas were, um, that's kind of the quintessential animal that everybody on the trip really, really wanted to see, was a lizard underwater. This is the only place in the world you're going to be able to see that. It is a lizard feeding underwater like this. And the marine iguanas, where we went at Fernandina, they would wait until, they would bask themselves on the rocks all morning long, and then they would wait until they were nice and warm. They were really storing up energy so that they could launch themselves off into the waves, and then they would go and they'd start feeding. And so only once they were nice and warmed up, and it was somewhere around like 10.30, that they started really taking off into the water. And you would get in the water and you'd kind of bob around at the surface, and I, I'd just look for heads, and you'd see this group of heads at the surface, so you'd go over to those, and then you'd find one at the surface, see it breathing up, and then it would dive down, just like what you're seeing there. Uh, and so I, I followed a couple of them down, and so you could see them swimming down, and then just pose. And, you know, you'd spend... I like the love in your eyes. Oh, wow. <laughs> it landed right next to me. At least you didn't oh, say it's some girl who I can't remember his name. <laughs> And so you just pose for these, next to these lizards. And they just, be, in fact, there was one, uh, there was a video of one of our friends that it, her husband was taking a video of her, and she was just watching one iguana. And then a wave came by and picked her up. And as it picked her up, it also picked up the lizard that was clinging to her back. That was, so it, the whole thing just went counter wompy and just, she it flopped her over onto the reef. Um, and the iguana. And the iguana and everything else. And so she, I mean, obviously the iguana was fine. It was just kind of a. It was. She didn't even realize it was there. <laughs> um, but then again, we had to leave the iguanas. We had to move on. And where do you move on to from iguanas other than Isabella Island? And Isabella is the home of the molas, or at least that's where the biggest cleaning station is for those. Days. The cleaning station is down at about 110 feet, and uh, you just kind of you dive down and you sit there and you wait and you wait and you wait and. You wait. and Actually, when we were there, uh, we had one photographer that went out and thought, well, there's a mola, I'm going to swim. He charged straight at it, scared most of them away. But we did manage to wait there long enough to get a couple of other molas to come by. And so these molas, this one, I'm guessing we're probably, I was overestimating, I guess. I, I thought it was more like seven or eight feet. Shh, shh. Uh, I thought it was more like seven or eight feet long. It was actually more like, I guess, six feet uh, tall instead. <laughs> and uh, they were just beautiful. They'd just kind of sit there they'd, 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 they'd in vertical <laughs> positions while the other fish would just kind of come by and clean them. The cleaning stations were definitely a big draw. And, and we have cleaning stations here. You do get to see things like uh, mantas and uh, other things around there. The cleaning stations there uh, brought in things like molas. Um, in between dives, we did get to do a snorkel. And we went back. In fact, Sarah and I went back and uh, found our way to this little cove. And while we were playing with mobulas in that cove, we, I, I poked my head up and uh, noticed that there was this little thing that was about this tall just kind of climbing up a rock. And as soon as Sarah saw that, she says that she was restraining herself, but she was, it's a penguin. A penguin was just kind of crawling up and over the rock. And it, it's just adorable, because they're, they're only, they only stand about that tall. <coughs> And then when they hit the water, they're just little bullets, and they're just firing. You have no chance of keeping up with them. So but we, we were smart. What's that? Can't stop it. 
See, it, it, it has an effect on you. <laughs> <laughs> but it got in the water, unlike anybody else that I've heard of going to the Galapagos, nobody else comes back with like a really cool penguin encounter. And I feel like we had a really fun one. As you, this is Larry just losing his mind as this Galapagos is coming out of um, or is this uh, penguin who's coming out of The penguins, are, we found them to be quite friendly, but they, not everybody has that uh, thing. Sometimes you just see like a bullet just going through the water and it's just a, a penguin going by, no big deal. <laughs> so yeah, penguins. <laughs> Um, and Sarah wanted to put sweaters on them, and I, I had to put my foot down and hide the sweaters that she brought with her. What's that? What's that? What is that? That's, 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 that's Batman. <laughs> um, Batman here, uh, this is a giant manta ray. Giant manta rays were at one of our last stops, Cabo Marshall. Yes, and um, pelagic mantas, the big ones. So compared to the mantas that we have here, these guys are every bit of oh, probably twice the size or so. They're huge animals. Um, and I actually, we spent with three dives at Cabo Marshall looking for manta rays. And uh, they, they came by and a couple of people had some really good encounters. And it wasn't until the last dive that I had one that came through and it flew straight at my head and kind of passed right over me. So I did a matrix maneuver as it passed by, turned, and then came right back through me again in case I didn't get it the first time. So uh, this guy, in fact, uh, one of the cool things, so these guys again are visiting cleaning stations and they're getting cleaned by things like angelfishes, but you would also find things like these little grunts or you'd also get things like um, uh, Kampachi, Amberjack, hunting the fish that were clinging to the outside of the mantis. So here's this <laughs> grunt that's looking for the cleaners and the other little fish that are hanging out around the mouth of the manta ray. After the manta rays, uh, we had our last land tour. And the land tour that we were going for on this one really targeted the Galapagos ports. Uh, the ones that we saw ranged in size from about this big all the way up to about this taller. So huge, huge animals. Um, these are the place that we went. It was a farm that didn't keep Galapagos tortoises specifically. It just happened to provide habitat for them. And apparently there's an ordinance that tells farmers that they can only put fences about yay high or yay close to the ground so the Galapagos tortoises can pass underneath of them. So um, this was just a natural habitat and that's why you've got like a swampland there and the tortoises are just free ranging. They're just kind of everywhere. Weirdly, Galapagos tortoises, this guy they figured was about, I think our guide said he was probably about 150 years old, which means that, well, for one thing, he was alive roughly around the time that Darwin had visited, but more importantly, he was alive and able to remember a time when we had hunted them. So this was this is an animal that remembers watching his brothers and sisters get hunted for food. And so they didn't like us at all. Um, as slow as a tortoise can move, they're still, and when they see you, they just kind of turn and they look away. That's why we didn't get, you don't see any like close up headshots of a tortoise and because we couldn't get very close to them. You didn't want to get, you, you just disturbed them if you did that. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of an interesting reminder of the impacts, uh, the, the long reaching impacts that human presence can have on a, on a population boundary. Our last day was spent at Santa Cruz out of the tortoises. And at Santa Cruz, even then, you're still looking at things like marine iguanas clinging to the docks on the side. We thought that this was a painting, and we actually went up, and there were marine iguanas just climbing up this wall. And they were just sitting there and getting ready to rest there for the night. That doesn't, that's not restful, but I'll go with it. <laughs> One of the cool things about marine iguanas, I, I was fascinated by these things, by the way, but they, they eat so much algae, so much saltwater-based diet, that they um, come on shore and they, they sneeze. And we, as a group, actually came up with a term for the sneezing. Um, this, this material that this guy's sneezing out right now is called snalt. Uh, <laughs> uh, but this snalt, they would sneeze it out pretty periodically. In fact, our, our friend had a really funny video where he put some really cheesy 70s porn music to <laughs> slow-motion shots of these guys sneezing. <laughs> It was pretty awesome. Um, but in addition, inside the harbor, in Santa Cruz Harbor, this is one of the main harbors mm -hmm. at the Galapagos, you'd still get big schools of Calmos rays coming through. Mm -hmm. Or you'd get these baby limbatus sharks, there were probably 20 or 30 of those that were just cruising around inside. Or you'd get Tina um, trying to stuff marine iguanas into her backpack. <laughs> that's beside the point. <laughs> but folks, that's pretty much it. Uh, that's pretty much all I can for you. So uh, with that, thank you for your attention. Um, I'd love to field any questions, not that I expect too many. Oh, yes, absolutely, Renee.
So I have a question. So at Darwin and Wolf, where you yeah. have those really strong currents, did you take your camera? Was it possible to take a picture when you were like holding on for dear life? No. Or, like flag? Like what do you? Like what did you do? So the stronger the current, this is the general rule there. The stronger the current, the more life you get. And that's apparently the rule other places as well. So I've been kind of periodically looking around Big Island, looking for big currents as well. But um, the, that's the rule. So you want to take your camera down, especially when there's big currents. Uh, you usually, there's a video of me kind of doing what I was doing. I, was, I find a spot to kind of hunker down. There, there's not a lot of coral to really worry about there. It's all just big boulders. So you just kind of sit on the bottom and try and find an eddy. And I just kind of pin myself in. And with my feet and yeah. just stare off into the blue just like that. And so yeah, the, the camera does drag, but if you find yourself a good eddy, especially a rock that you can hide behind where the yeah. uh, animals aren't going to see you. And then the other big tip, if you are going to the dog go soon, I'd recommend finding a rock and then staking it out, especially when like watch the hammerheads where they're going. Because sometimes they'll come in a lot closer towards certain rocks that are getting mm -hmm. better, more cleaning stations. Mm -hmm. So find one of those rocks and then hide behind it and wait, and you can actually watch as a hammerhead is coming towards you. So you watch, hold your breath as you duck. I didn't say hold no, your breath, no. but you know what I'm yeah, getting yeah. at. Time your breathing. And time your breathing. Time your breathing. As you're behind slow the rock, breathing. you duck. Slow the breathing. Duck yeah. behind the rock, slow your breathing, and just wait <laughs> for the hammerhead until, and you kind of got to time it in such a way that you can say, okay, it's about uh, 15 seconds away that you go back and and then once 15 seconds, boom, pop, and you got your shot. And it's really, it's a, it's, it's a tricky kind of thing that doesn't always work, but um, that's really it. Like, the hammerheads just don't like bubbles, and they don't, they're not all that friendly, as many as there are. In fact, there was that one shot where there was a whole bunch of hammerheads over sand, right? There was, I think, at the Darwin slide. That was a really cool spot, because you could see them all down there, and then you'd go down to the sand and thinking, aha, this is, yeah, and they just kind of spread out away from you as you go down. So you really have to, you, you had to employ some tricks to get them yeah. to come in. I found, and nobody believes me, but I found that actually banging two rocks together worked. Nobody else thought that it was working. In fact, they were watching me bang two rocks together. Yeah, together. Yeah, it works, right? Yeah. 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 They, they tell us it works, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> just doing it, and like, yeah. okay. But, yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought it worked, and nobody else did, but whatever. I, I came away with some hammerhead shots that I was quite proud of, so you know, awesome. go, I'm good. Go. Go. Yeah, it's like in Palau when you get hooked in on the reef because of the current. Do, yep. they, do you think they'd let you do that? Sure. Uh, we did bring some reef hooks. I never used mine. Uh, most other people, I think you were the only one that did use I them. used the reef hook once in a while because I didn't want to wear gloves. So mm -hmm. either you wear gloves and you just clamp on with a rock, and a lot of times they're barnacles. So yeah, yeah. It was either have my arm occupied or have my hook in. And then I had my arms free, but then you were kind of flagging. And a lot of the times up here, there, you want to hide, so you want to duck down. So that yeah, that's kind of if I hooked it, I hooked it like over the edge of that one, and then I kind of slumped down on the side mm -hmm. of the rock. So yeah, they, nice they worked either way. It's nice to have both hands free. Too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, DSLR, I mean, and get, get, you know. I yeah that's that's right. why I patented my uh, my pin yourself in maneuver, where it's yeah. the, the, the reflux. So most of your... The diving is actually you like sitting and hiding and letting out. It's like a manta dive. dive. Yeah. It's, it's like the yeah. animal yeah. on the drift dive and you're like it's, you're stationary. Yeah. It's kind of like a parade where you're trying right. to take photos of the floats oh, going okay. by. Uh, it's, cool. It really is just a constant something. And they're going by so slow that you've got time to time your shot and line it up and really try and line it up. But the the visibility was a challenge, mm -hmm. and the cold water was a challenge because your your camera is fogging up as you're mm -hmm. trying to do stuff. Even though there's not really a leak, it's just condensing. Mm -hmm. The warm air and then the cold water. Yeah. yeah. You so as a yeah, I'm sure as a as marine biologist, yep. an avid photographer, and mm -hmm. a shark nut. <laughs> Scale of one to ten with, with ten being incredible, how would you rate the lava? I, I I thought each of the dives started off with. Well, especially the Wolf and Darwin just started off, they were, they were tense. And I think there was one dive where uh, we, we looked out at Wolf and Darwin that we were like, um, this is okay. But that, you can't really predict that. That's just kind of a one dive that'll be really just knock your, knock your socks off awesome. And then the next dive at the same spot could be, well, it's okay. And then you go back to the same spot again and bam, and all of a sudden the ocean's exploded all over you again. Mm -hmm. um, the diving with Lavos, I've never seen anything like it. It was unbelievable. Uh, yeah, I haven't been there. It'd be my first time next year going. Okay. I've been to Cocos. Okay. And Cocos is great. I mean, but 
what I've heard about, I, there's not as much diversity as what I know you're, you just showed and what I've heard. I yeah. mean, you see tons of shards. You'll see 300 hammerheads yep. in your view. And you'll see like silver tips and some Galapagos sharks. And it's all about sharks. You'll see some other things too, some big bait balls. Like, but after that, there's really not that yeah. much more diversity to see compared to what and there were that's showing. And also the Galapagos, it's like in the cocoa, it's kind of like how you explain a Galapagos, I think more so because that's what we were told. They're really shy. I mean, it was really hard to get them to come close to us. Oh, yeah. You can see the 300, but to get them to come in close where I hear Galapagos. That they at least will come in, like you say, got a high pop out, yeah. right? I couldn't yeah. touch the Galapagos. And the Silkies, we had to push away. Yeah, so, yeah. so yeah. I mean, yeah. like, they were there. Were you just yeah. snorkeling yeah. with the yeah. Silkies? Yeah. What's that? Were you just snorkeling with the Silkies? Yeah, yeah. yeah. you yeah. just, and then as you're, it was, it was really it was kind awesome. of, it was pretty <laughs> incredible because you're just drifting back. And here's this, it, okay, the Rainbow Runners are like five feet long. Seriously. Everything there is big and in the thousands. They were talking huge and in the thousands. Mm -hmm. And this Rainbow Runner that was just kind of hanging out with our boat was about five feet long. And you just drift back, and that's the first thing you saw. And then behind him was this school of 20 silkies that were just kind of on the bottom at first. And then as soon as they see you, they just kind of wind up and straight out of you. Just, <laughs> it, it, as Sarah's saying, you have to kind of push them off and just, oh, wow, you're, you're Nosy and pretty close. But then we, we hung on to a line at the very end of the boat that the pingas were attached to, and then because the current was um, three or four knots or whatever, mm -hmm. so we'd hold on to that line, and the silkies would literally be underneath us. We could have like wrapped our legs around them if we wanted to, you know, just like right there, and they were just swimming with the current, yep. staying in place, just closer and closer and closer. It was awesome. And, and, and just back to revisit Kevin's thought real quick, and that is. The diversity at, at the Galapagos. There, there were some people on board that were kind of Darwin and Wolf. They, they liked it. The first few dives, the first four dives, they loved it. But it was a little bit too much Darwin and Wolf for them. And they, they were like, okay, we've seen some big life. I want to see something else. And which blows my mind. But it, there, people dive for different things. And the um, the neat thing about the Galapagos is they've got they've got the they've got the marine iguanas as you saw, the molas, the cormorants, the penguins. You know, it, that's the kind of diversity that you don't get elsewhere, like Cocos or uh, Socorro or um, really anywhere else up and down the west. Well, I was reading that endemism is close to 70-75% of the animals that you see can only be seen there. Mm -hmm. So the nudibranchs are all unique. The um, gobies are all unique. The you know basslets were all unique. All of the weird fish that you don't ever get to see anywhere else in the world. So. Mm -hmm. I love the little things too. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I was just going to ask about that. I see a lot of big stuff. What yeah. was the the small life about? I mean, uh, I was into the small stuff, but everyone else kind of liked all the, the big camera. So you got you got to kind of refocus on what you're saying. Yeah. Right? <laughs> what you want to see, refocus on finding small. I, I was actually there. I, I wanted to find a barnacle blend. Mm -hmm. And this is a blenny that lives in barnacles. And it, the only reason I wanted to find that was I, I did some research at a, at a stock photo agency that I was thinking about submitting some photos to. That that was one of the animals that they wanted was a Galapagos um, barnacle blenny. Hmm. And so I went there and I had the visual in my head and I even took a photo of something that I thought might have been one. But uh, it turns out it was a barnacle bill blenny that I shot. Hmm. And the barnacle blenny was something else. So uh, very closely related too, I think. And <laughs> one's really endangered and one's not. So. Um, Oh, shucks, next time. I, I will say this is just kind of a parting word. Like, it, it's an expensive trip, but nobody there came back thinking, hmm, what a waste of money. No, it was mind blowing. I would go there pain. 10 more times before I went to Palau again. Yeah. That was the place. Right. And uh, what month were you there? Was it March, April? We were there this two month. weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, I thought it was like longer ago. No. I, no, this was uh, two weeks ago. Because I, I remember seeing your pictures. I think I'm getting into stuff. Like, I don't know. Um, but what, and what boat did you go on? Did you like the, the boat? Master. Okay. Yep, the Master. It's a new boat. Um, I think it used to be yeah. called the Deeper Blue. Deep Blue. Uh, now it's called the Master. It's run by the Siren Fleet. Um, mm -hmm. and in fact, while we were there, it's very, very. It's so new that the there was a Siren Fleet representative coaching them on how to bring it up to the Siren Fleet's standards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's that new. So mm -hmm. they're still they're still working out some things, but honestly the staff was amazing. Uh, they, the Ponga drivers were very good at what they did. 
Um, the, the guy you want off the boat safely, efficiently, and every between every dive you had hot chocolate and a snack or a the meal bartender. or the bartender was. Yeah. Yeah. Are you connected to Wi-Fi right now? I don't know. It's our Wi-Fi. Because <clears throat> you good. bring up uh, our web page and, and, and it'll show the boat. It's a beautiful boat. It's a small boat. It only carries 16 people, right? A lot of little yeah, boards will carry we well had, over 20. Yeah, I think we mm -hmm. only had 16. Well, we had, there's eight cabins. So yeah, there's eight six, cabins, six two cabins. Cabin. Yeah. Which is a nice grouping, you know. Some of the boats we only had 14 or 13 divers on our trip, plus yeah. uh, Mark, who was doing the uh, quality inspection type stuff. So he went, we jumped on for free and did that with the siren fleet. So. Good about being tight, Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, you gotta get everybody pumped up for it, man. <laughs> it was amazing. You click on uh, tra trip tra travel page there. And how did you decide like which month to go? Because you know, it seems like there's pros and cons to going like in the summer Absolutely. versus the winter versus the spring. Well, you guys go for like ten. Ten, ten days are hard to get. There's hardly yeah. any boats that do yeah. ten days. Yeah, yeah. On, we so booked it over a year in advance, but we had one special like kind of pre-booked kind of grouping. You guys, this is this is uh, our. We chartered the boat. Our owner, Byron, back there was nice enough to cut charter the boat, the Galapagos Master, for next year, September 17th, wow. the same boat they were on, uh, for a seven day trip, because most of them are seven day trips, if anybody's interested. You wanna... And if you go to our travel page and you scroll, if you scroll down a little bit, there's a ton of information on there about the trip. Again, it only carries 16, there's some pictures, the rooms are nice, right? I mean, the roots are huge. Yeah, they're big. <laughs> they were like and, twice as big as the one I had in Palau. On the, and whether it's for and a couple. I got to sleep in peace because there was this chastity bump between the two beds, so she couldn't cuddle with me. It was just a weird room, right? Um, it was two twins put together, so there was this like metal bar yeah. in between. <laughs> so she she couldn't reach over and like you know cuddle and make me all hot in the middle of the night. So it was that was really really nice. <laughs> like found the picture of the room though. Right, right here. Yeah. And the rooms for uh, couples, they can put the beds together like you guys yep. have, right? Yep. Or if there's two singles sharing, two guys and gals, they can both separate them. Pretty much set the beds on the floor. Yeah, it's really nice. nice. It's a beautiful boat. But it's all about the diving and the experience, right? And huh. this next week, I'm going to have information on a second boat that we're offering. It's not chartered. We're not chartering it, the second boat, because I'm not sure we're going to have that much time to do a second week. But the second week's going to be on the MBS Rail. We'll have that on the site. For people who want to stay a second week, you have to stay another night at the Galapagos to get on that boat to do all this more land. Mm -hmm. Which is and free diving also, as you say, you'd still be free diving. Also, you mention time of year, we, we pick a boat for September for more shot at whale sharks. Yep. The whale, whale sharks, sharks there are, are apparently way bigger than any of the other whale sharks yeah. in the world. And everything is bigger there, but the whale sharks, they said, were 40 to 60 feet. Yeah. I didn't even know they got 60 feet. Our hopes are we see everything that Jeff and Sarah saw plus <laughs> Anybody's that arrested. We didn't see any whale sharks. We were looking. You guys want to see a photo of a toilet? Oh, yes. There you go. Nice. Is that yeah. the one you personally use? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the no, configuration <laughs> wrong. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it was beautiful. It was. It was gorgeous. The sun deck was awesome. Yeah. We spent That's a lot nice. of time up there watching the stars at night. And uh, we turn off the lights on the sun deck and then watch the stars. Cool. Which you can, like, you know, and you can watch like, nowhere, you, know? you can watch schools of fish bioluminescing in the water right. at night. And so there'd just be this. Uh, I remember one night I pointed out this huge kind of glow, and we all thought, "Is that a whale shark? What is that?" And then it kind of came in, and as we watched it, it came in closer to the light, and then we realized it's a school of fish, a big school of fish that's bioluminescing everywhere. Right. And I think it was just sending off disturbing dinoflagellates, you know. And then you could see another school of bigger predatory fish come in and scatter them. So it looked like this, like, it's suddenly like everybody's focused on this glowing ball that just suddenly went, yeah. <laughs> it's so cool.